the children who are, are yet to be vaccinated, and I'm particularly worried about um, complacency um, with respect to kids because our messaging to that population so far has been about their low risk and ability to get back to school. So I, I think we need to start thinking about how we are going to um, how we are going to you know um, impart confidence in in vaccinations for kids. And of course, we need data um, that's forthcoming, but we need to start thinking about that. Um, there is strong evidence in the literature for the use of health provider recommendations to overcome vaccine complacency and lingering issues with vaccine confidence. Um, however, to ensure that providers can make good recommendations, they need to have appropriate resources that they can tap into. So I think we need to start working on those. Um, and we also need to support provider time and reimbursement for vaccine counseling. So I think it's time to start thinking about um, those kinds of scenarios and, and begin setting up some of the policies and programs that will help us target some of the more hesitant uh, people as we move forward. Absolutely. Thank you. And I appreciate you introducing the, uh, the issue of access, because that's something else that we'd like to talk about today. Uh, but for now, Professor Farahani, I'd like to move on to you. As more and more people are getting vaccinated, there's been discussion of using vaccine passports as a pass for people to engage in certain activities. Companies are developing apps to do this digitally, and some airlines have said they're interested in using the tech for travel, but it's, there's also been pushback and it's becoming a very political issue. What are some of the benefits and risks of using vaccine passports in general? The benefits, I think, are few, but I will lay out, um, and I'll spend more time, I think, focusing a, a bit on the risks. So, you know, obviously, people are anxious to get back to some sense of normal, post-pandemic normal. Um, and the ability to be able to do things like participate um, in activities that we haven't been able to participate in fully, whether that's going to a restaurant or getting on an airplane or um, even just being able to gather with other people in larger groups and in, in places indoors where we haven't been able to do so. Um, people think that a vaccine passport, if they know that all of the other people who are there at one of these institutions, whether that's a concert hall or somewhere else is vaccinated, that that um, would give them a greater sense of security. It might lead to people be more willing to participate in a lot of these activities that they've been hesitant to do. And that could be a big boost to the economy. It could give people um, a sense of, uh, of safety and, and uh, ability to re-engage. It also originally was being uh, discussed as a, as a way to give people reminders, right? It's important, especially for the two dose regimens that people get both doses of the vaccine and um, to have something that documents when you receive the first vaccine, which kind of vaccine you first received, was it Pfizer, was it Moderna, was it a different kind of vaccine? Such that if you go to a different place, you get both a reminder when your second dose is due and you know, and you're able to share with whoever the provider is, what kind of vaccine you first received to make sure that you receive the proper second dose. Um, so I think the intuition and the drive toward uh, getting passports is an understandable one. And the value, particularly for being able to have reminders um, through things like vaccine cards, is a sensible one. There are a lot of risks, though, to adopting this kind of an approach, this vaccine passport approach. So while appealing, I don't think we should rush to adopt them, um, and I'm not sure that we ever should. I think the moment at which it might be ethical to adopt it is the moment at which we wouldn't need them anymore. So let me just lay out what some of those potential concerns are. <clears throat> the first is a false sense of security. We're starting to develop data that shows that people who are vaccinated are unlikely, at least with some of the vaccines, to become infected themselves, therefore unlikely to spread it to other people. But there's still a risk that you're spreading it to other people. And so if people have the sense that if they are vaccinated and if others are vaccinated, that there's no risk of transmission, they may um, un unwittingly uh, start to let down their guard in ways that could be particularly dangerous, either to people who are vulnerable or um, to Chip's point to the children who are not yet vaccinated. I have two small children. If suddenly because I'm vaccinated and my husband is vaccinated, we choose to participate in all of the activities that we did previously, there's still a risk that we could bring it home to our children, that we could expose them or that in taking them with us to these different types of locations, they could be at risk. The second is an equity concern. So you've heard already about the distribution of the vaccines. Um, we're getting there. We're doing a great job of starting to roll it out in much uh, wider availability across the population. But notice that the way we prioritized vaccination wasn't by um, the people who were economically hit the hardest by the pandemic. Instead, it was the people who were the most vulnerable of serious disease or death. 
Um, and that was in part because of the moment that we were in at which we needed to distribute the vaccines. Um, if it had happened earlier, you might have happened, you might have had a different strategy, or if we had been able to contain the virus more, you might have had a different strategy where you would distribute it to the people who are most likely to be out and about in society and spreading it to other people. Or you might have chosen, for example, to distribute it to the people who were most economically harmed and therefore need to be able to reintegrate into the society more quickly. If we condition participation in society based on access to a vaccine passport, and we do so now at this moment when there are um, at least half of the US population who do not yet have access to the vaccine or who aren't fully vaccinated, then what you'll see is a widening gap. Jobs that were lost during the pandemic will go to the people who were able to gain earlier access to the vaccines. And I'll note that as part of that, the minority populations in the United States have been the hardest hit. And that's for a multitude of reasons, um, not the least of which is is that many of them didn't have the benefit of being able to work from home or work remotely. A lot of them were essential frontline workers um, who were either uh, out and uh, being you know, exposed to COVID or were individuals who lost their jobs because the job started to shut down. Those individuals, if we start to say you can't participate in society or in these different activities, um, we expect to see a kind of widening gap between these individuals and a greater loss of public trust uh, in minority populations who already are experiencing a significant amount of distrust with respect to social institutions and also public health institutions. We need to be able to continue to cultivate trust in individuals such that they want to get vaccinated such that when it is available to them, they're able to do so. The next reason is because these are drugs that do not yet have full regulatory approval. And that's not a small point. These are drugs that have emergency use authorization. And so far, it seems like they have robust efficacy and it seems like they have robust safety. But we don't know for sure yet. I was an early uh, participant in the Moderna study. Um, just yesterday, I had my seven month follow up visit from the vaccine. And there were a new set of questions that they were asking with respect to safety because we're continuing to look to see are there any safety concerns that arise when you have it distributed to a much larger population? You might start to see rare side effects as you start to expand the number of people who've taken the drug. That's important data, and that's important data that goes into full regulatory approval for a drug. I think up until we have full regulatory approval for a drug, requiring people to take it, and that's what a vaccine passport would do. It would say you cannot get onto a plane, you cannot go into a public place, you cannot go into a restaurant, you cannot necessarily even have a job um, for the job sites that start to require it, or you can't attend an educational institution without your vaccine passport in hand. It conditions participation on taking a drug that hasn't received full regulatory approval. And I think that essentially conscripts people to being research participants, which isn't how we run clinical trials. It isn't how we address the issue of informed consent in society. Um, and I think it would erode public trust in the regulatory process. Um, you see a lot of people making this kind of claim about liberty. And I would say um, that's an issue we can talk about, but there's a privacy concern of having non-covered entities, having access to our health information and starting to say that we expand the number of people who can have direct access to our health information. So we can talk a little bit more about those privacy issues in the Q&A. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Professor Parahani, and thank you to all of our panelists for those comprehensive opening answers. We certainly have a lot to dig into here. At this point, we will open it up to questions. Um, thanks to everyone who submitted questions in advance. I'm going to start with those. But in the meantime, you can also pose questions via the Q&A window at any time. If you'd like to ask a question in person, raise your hand in Zoom and we will unmute you when your turn comes around. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Thanks also to everyone watching this on YouTube. Um, so I said we've got some questions that have come in and uh, Professor Vasudhavan, I'd like to, to start with you. We've had a question that asks what you're hearing about vaccine hesitancy abroad, especially in China where some of the population may no longer see the virus as a threat and in Africa where people might be wary of Western powers or suffer from a lack of good information about the vaccines. Now, of course, obviously there are huge uh, access issues across the world too, and I know that plays into that. And so, um, so yeah, what have you heard about that? And what are leaders in, in some, of, some other countries doing to incentivize vaccination and what more needs to be done, do you think? Yeah, Greg, I think it's an important point to discuss because um, even though we are focused a lot in this conversation on uh, vaccinations in the US, 
unless we can achieve widespread vaccinations and control the pandemic on a global scale, we are not going to be safe in the US, even if we have quote unquote herd immunity within the US boundaries. Um, I, I think access is a big issue. Um, according to UNICEF, over 130 countries have um, no access to the COVID-19 vaccine. So I think that by itself tells you how far away we are from um, ending this pandemic. Um, I've also heard from colleagues in Tanzania and other places um, that they're seeing a surge in um, cases. And I think a lot of that is fueled by variants. Um, and you know, just general lack of testing, but they are seeing a, a lot more severe instances of COVID-19. Um, in places like India, again, um, so India had um, offered to share vaccines with other countries, but they've had to pull out of some of those agreements or reduce some of those agreements because they're seeing a, a surge in cases within their own boundaries. So I think there are a lot of logistical and access related challenges um, that play a role. I think with respect to some of the specific comments you mentioned, yes, those are pretty prevalent. Um, and again, have to do with the general mistrust of where the vaccines are coming from, um, who has control over the vaccines, and um, how willing they are to share the vaccines. Sure, thank you. And Professor Walter, I wanted to ask you to, to weigh in on this, this question of access. As we know, as Professor Vasudevan just mentioned, there are more than 100 countries that don't have access to the vaccine. We know um, from the global health that the old chestnut of a vaccine, an outbreak anywhere is an outbreak everywhere. Um, do you think that long term access is going to prove to be a larger issue for the world in stamping out this pandemic than hesitancy is? I, I do think access is going to be a big issue, I probably, and, and I would venture to say probably more, Greg, than, than hesitancy. I mean, I think there always will be vaccine hesitant people, but I, I worry about the access issue and the fact that one of our big drivers here, I think, in the United States and pushes to get, uh, you know, increased coverage here in the United States is the emergence of, of viral variants. And if we don't, and as I, I think Lavanya uh, alluded to, if we don't get a handle on that globally, we may see the emergence of, of more variants and, and some of them could be, you know, more resistant and, uh, to coverage by our current vaccine armamentarian that we have. So I, I, I think we do need to really make an effort to, to attack this on a global scale. Thank you. And we'll return to the uh, topic of variants in a little bit, but we've had a question come in for Professor Farahani. Um, we've had uh, several large states banning vaccine passports or discussing uh, banning of vaccine passports. And uh, the question um, that's asked is, what does that mean for the future of that technology? And does it signal that there's already a culture war surrounding vaccines and vaccine requirements in the same way that mask wearing became a political issue? Does this, um, does the, 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 the fuss over the furor over vaccine passports have a risk in further politicizing vaccines themselves, do you think? Probably. Um, I've been surprised uh, that there have been uncomfortable bedfellows together in uh, the opposition to vaccine passports. On the one hand, you have a lot of people who are talking about the equity issues that arise from the use of vaccine passports. And, um, and that's an issue that's a moment in time, right? Which is, if you're talking about the US population and using it only within the US, at some point, there will be widespread availability of the vaccines such that anybody who wants to gain um, the vaccine uh, or anybody who wants to have the vaccine can have it um, and they'll have full regulatory approval. And at that moment in time, um, some of the equity concerns wouldn't continue to persist. What you see instead in some places is that there are strong libertarian um, and conservative voices that uh, are joining um, with the individuals who are opposed to it for those equity reasons, um, arguing that there's a liberty interest and in not being required to have vaccinations. Um, and I would say this to that, which is we have uh, we have in the past and in certain contexts, whether it's in healthcare settings or in um, education, like for example, when my daughter went to kindergarten this year, we've required vaccination in certain contexts. And I think um, it's permissible for us to require vaccination in certain contexts. The mechanism by which this type of um, vaccine passport is rolling out is very different than how we have done it traditionally in the past. 
And we need to have a moment where we actually reflect on that and decide what the appropriate pathway forward is. Suddenly you have a lot of corporations who are trying to get into the game of owning different biometric information about individuals that would serve as a gateway um, to access and entry into different settings. And that's, that's different in kind uh, than we have seen with the traditional use of you know, the state authorized vaccination list that you give for kindergarten or the yellow books that you have if you travel internationally for certain types of vaccines that we require in order to not bring those types of diseases back into the United States and to safeguard the population. So I think that there is um, a strain, a kind of political strain that is starting to emerge around a liberty interest. And then there is this other strain that's really around equity and concerns about public trust. They all share in common and opposition, just different reasons and rationales for it. And so what my hope is, is that it will not become a conservative versus liberal, that instead people will see that there's a lot of commonality to the concerns and it doesn't need to be politicized. We need to look at what the risks of the introduction of these vaccine passports are and think carefully about what the right approach is, the multifaceted approach to be able to reopen society safely. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, hands raised here. And so we're going to go to the first one, Michael McElroy. Uh, we've unmuted you. So please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, this weekend, uh, Dr. Michael Osloholm of the Center of Infectious Disease Research and Policy in Minnesota said that the data shows that the UK variant is more contagious, uh, especially, among, obviously, we know that, but uh, especially among children. Um, and he said that all things that we had planned it for about kids and schools with the virus are really no longer applicable. So is he right? And what should parents think about the data that shows this variant being more contagious for children? Uh, you know, what, what should they do with this information? Is it still outdated, the previous guidance on the older versions of the virus? Is it still safe to send kids to school? Dr. Walter, would you like to tackle that one? Yeah. Um, thanks. So sorry. Um, yeah, I think the, the the underlying most of the information we have to date um, in terms of school and school attendance um, suggests that that um, it is okay for children to attend school if um, you know certain precautions are in place with social distancing. And, and masking. And, and I think um, in communities where that's been done, it's been done fairly successfully uh, to date. You know, I, I do think that uh, the UK variant is, is a little bit different. We don't have as much experience here in this country uh, with that at this point, although I, the evidence suggests that, that that's increasing. Um, I don't know that we know for sure that that should change at this point, our recommendations for, for school attendance. I, I just don't think we have any good, good data to, to say that at this point. I think we still need, to, if, if children, if parents, I mean, it's really important, I think, for children's well-being to attend school and to be able to attend school and do the things that they normally do. Uh, for children and for parents. And, and I don't think that we need to rush to change things without without more information at this point. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I hope that answered your question. We've got some more hands raised, so we're going to move on. We have um, uh, somebody with the hand raised on the CBS 17 digital desk. So you're now unmuted. If you have a question, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, hi, this is Judith with CBS 17. My question is, you know, we already, when it comes to international travel, my question is regarding passports, sorry. Um, we already have some vaccines that are required. So what would be the difference between requiring a COVID-19 vaccine for a cruise or international travel versus the, the others that are already required? So there's a few differences. Uh, one is the drugs that are included on those lists that we require for international travel um, have widespread availability for anybody who needs them for purposes of travel, have full regulatory approval, um, are used in very limited context, 
uh, are not governed by third party corporations. That is, it's not um, a whole bunch of corporations who are getting into the, the game of being able to have access to your information um, and being the brokers of biometric information who are not covered entities under HIPAA, um, who don't have the same kind of privacy safeguards in place. And um, I worry that the use in a, in a much broader context, right, to participate in any aspect of society um, creates all of the other concerns that I've highlighted, the equity, the distribution concerns, the, um, you know, issues that we don't have full regulatory approval, the privacy concerns, et cetera. But I would say it's not that we cannot require vaccination in certain contexts. We do and we can. It's a question of whether or not these passports are appropriate to be used by society in, um, you know, across the board in many different settings. And the answer I think right now should be no.